If you love Allah, then you will follow His Prophet. So if you love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you will follow the sunnah of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says that Allah will love you and forgive your sins if you love Him. And the evidence and proof of the fact that you love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in exchange for which Allah will love you and forgive your sins, the proof of that is your following of Rasulullah This 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 dimension of love is very important. Oftentimes, we live in a period when we are obsessed with law. When we talk about Islam, we often talk about Islamic law and we forget to talk about the importance of spirituality and love. Prophet said that you will not be a believer unless you love me more than your wealth and your family. And not only that, more than other things that we possess. If you are a ruler, more than your military, more than your property, more than your power, more than your ideologies. If the Prophet, peace be upon him, is not the most beloved thing in your life, your faith is not complete. This is an important hadith. We have to remember that our faith is not complete until the Prophet becomes the most dearest thing to us in our lives. <coughs> we are fortunate to now live in a period where, which is to a great extent marked by what we now call as Islamophobia. Islamophobia is not new. Islamophobia began the day Prophet started giving dawah to people. And one aspect of Islamophobia is attacks on the personality of Prophet Muhammad <coughs> From day one, he was accused of being he was accused of being a person who, who had lost his mind. He was, he was accused of being mad. He was accused of being a magician. And so one attack as part of Islamophobia has been to question and undermine his credibility and demonize his personality. Today, too, we live in a period in which Prophet ﷺ is incessantly attacked. There's not a single day that goes by where someone is not casting aspirations on his personality. If someone is not writing an article or even a book attacking Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Ironically, in spite of all these attacks, we have not seen any major effort from Muslims across the world to counter these Islamophobic attacks on the life, on the character, on the personality, and the teachings of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam in a major way. There have always been two kinds of attacks. Until the mid-19th century, the attacks always came from Christian preachers and people of other religious orientations who attacked the Prophet as essentially a Christian heretic, as someone who was borrowing things from Christianity and cooking up the religion at home and trying to preach. So much of the response was in the realm of interfaith. But after the mid 19th century, especially with the growth of the British Empire, especially in India and others, we saw a new kind of attack coming against the Prophet Sallallahu personality, his character, his teachings, these were from secular people, who had no interest in defending any other religion, but just attack. So they would attack the Prophet Sallallahu personality, his history. Until the 18th century, we discovered something very interesting that for many hundreds of years before that, in the rise of the Ottoman Empire, etc., Muslims in general had become enamored with the mystical life and the mythical life of Prophet And they were not paying much attention to historical accuracies <coughs> in his life. And so when non-Muslims, especially secular scholars, they started to go and look at the biography and history of Prophet and start attacking him on history, a new genre of studies that started within the Muslim scholarship with the study of the Prophet Muhammad as a historical figure. Uh, one, for those of you who are from South Asia, you will remember the biographies written by Shibli Namani. 
uh, where they started writing the seerah of the Prophet Now you see even Muslims <coughs> writing the biography of Prophet Sallallahu nearly every year. A lot of prominent Western Muslims have written biographies. Tariq Ramadan wrote one, Umi Safi wrote another one, Sayyid Hussain Nasser wrote one, and they are coming out. Mashallah. It's the battle of ideas, it's a battle for the image of the Prophet. But it is amazing that even in this period when they are having so many attacks, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues to fulfill his promise. He says in the Quran, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, Barashana laka zikra. We have raised your mention, we have raised your praise in this world. And so even in this age of Islamophobia that we live in, in which the two main targets are the Quran and Prophet Muhammad is now the most common name. The most common name in the whole of this planet Earth is Muhammad. The word Muhammad means the most praised one. But Muhammad comes from hum, from praise, and it means one who has been praised the most. So even why there are people who are attacking him, there are people who are praising him because, mashallah, there are now more than a billion Muslims, and even if 10% of them are sending peace and blessings upon the Prophet <laughs> on a daily basis, you have more than 100 million people praying on his name every day. I don't think there is any other person alive in history, on whose name 100 million people may have prayed from the beginning of time. In the entire history of creation, I doubt if 100 million people have prayed on the name of one individual, as perhaps on a daily basis, hundreds of millions of people. At least on a Friday, we can be sure that when Muslims are at least praying two rakat, Salatul Jummah, they are sending durud in the name of Prophet now, that, in that period of time, what is our role? Why is there an attack on Prophet ﷺ? In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Hajja akum min Allahi nurun kitabun mubin. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent us two things. He sent us light, and He has sent us a clear scripture. Whenever you look at the discussion, you will notice that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always said that I have sent you the book with hikmah. I have sent you the book with light. And this light is the life of Prophet This light is Rasulullah subhanahu wa Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, people sometimes have these questions that uh, how other prophets have been mentioned more often than Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the Quran. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has used such beautiful and endearing terms for Rasulullah in the Quran. He calls him Mubashir, one who brings good news. He calls him Nazir, someone who has won. He calls him Shaheed, as one who has witnessed. And above all, he calls him Sirajun Munira, a lamp that is luminous. It is very important for us to delve on the mystical and legal aspects of what this means. What it means is to understand this message, this clear book, in the light of the life of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu That is very important for us to realize. And so when we combat Islamophobia, it is not just enough for us to send emails out there, or write articles about it. But what is important is to light those lamps in our lives. It is important that we light those lamps in our lives. To bring in some of the traditions of Prophet Sallallahu in our lives. Once you do that, once you do that, then you will see this billions of lights out there which are shining luminous in the Quran Prophet also is called as misbah as a lamp and some of these analogies that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses for the Prophet are similar to how he talks about himself Allah nuru samawati wal ard he talks about himself as light he also talks about Prophet as light he also talks about him as a lamp, his misbah, his sirad and munir, and also another lamp which is luminescent. And I think that one of the things that we have done in our lives is that we are so looking at ourselves through the eyes of others. Every Muslim today is like an actor on the global stage. We are either reacting or we are performing. 
And so what happens is that we begin to look at ourselves through the eyes of others, through the politics of others, through the agenda of others. We forget that we, we ought to have our own agenda, we ought to have our own politics, we ought to have our own goal. <laughs> and those things are to understand what it means to be a Muslim. And I submit to you that you cannot understand what it means to be a Muslim without understanding the life and the character, the personality, the challenges, and the way of Prophet Alhamdulillah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Bismillah ar rahim wa ma asalnaka illa rahmatu lil alameen. He's addressing the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, we have not sent you as anything but mercy to all of humanity. I'm sure, I'm sure you both of you have heard this a lot. In fact, some Muslims in North America have actually started, uh, a, I don't know what to call it, a movement or an organization called Mercy to Humanity on the basis of which they do a lot of webinars on the life and seela of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You can watch that if you like. But what does it mean to be sent as Mercy to Humanity? I want to remind you of an interesting tradition, and in the context of that, I will try to explain at least what I understand from this verse, inshallah. <coughs> a a Barbari once came to Umm al Aisha radiallahu anha and asked her, Tell me about the personality of the Prophet. And she said, Haven't you seen the Quran? In the Quran, that is the life, that is the personality of Prophet Muhammad. He is the embodiment of the heart. I'm sure you've heard this a lot of times, and I've heard it many times in many khutbahs, especially. Oftentimes, this, this hadith is used for two things. It, it is used to, to glorify the Prophet <coughs> by raising him to the standard of the Quran and saying his personality is like the Quran itself. And the whole idea is to impress upon the listeners the importance of it. But what does it really mean? What does it really mean to have a personality that is like that of the Quran? And in order to understand that, you have to understand what is the personality of the Quran. The Quran describes itself in many ways. And one of the interesting ways in which the Quran describes itself is as Qur'an. The Quran is Qur'an. Qur'an is that capacity which enables the possessor to distinguish between what is right and what is wrong, to distinguish between what is manifest and what is hidden, what is zahir and what is batir, what is real and what is unreal, what is right, what is wrong, what is legal, what is illegal, what is permitted, what is prohibited. To be able to make this distinction is what Qur'an is. And that is what the Qur'an does for believers. It tells us what is permitted, it tells us what is prohibited, it tells us things which are lahir. It talks about the orbits, talks about the solar system, and then it talks about things which are <coughs> hidden from us, from Alam al ghaib from the unseen world. It makes those things apparent to us. So now if you were to have the personality of the Quran, what does it mean? It means that you also should have the capacity of Quran to distinguish what is right and what is wrong, to be able to tell you what is hidden and what is not hidden. To be able to distinguish between these. This is one of the most, this is what being a moral human being is all about, to possess for part. And that is why it is important that we do not think of Prophet <coughs> as just a messenger of Allah, because in this case, the messenger is also the message itself. You must understand that, that the messenger is also the message itself. We have to treat his seerah as a tafsir of the Quran. The books that he brought, he lived it. And therefore, if you want to see a tafsir, a commentary of the book that he brought, look at his life. And by looking at his life, you can understand the book that he brought. Because he is like the book, he is Quran. What he takes, you take. What he leaves, you leave. And that is very important for us to understand. But this analogy, in comparison between Rasulullah and the Quran, is very interesting. Allah says in the Quran, 
بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وننزل من القرآن ما هو شفاء ورحمة للمؤمنين ولا يزيد الظالمين إلا خفاء Now this is a fascinating verse. Everything in the Quran I find fascinating. So if I keep using the word, please forgive me. <coughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, and we send out the Quran that is healing and mercy to those who believe. So the Quran has come as a rahmah to the believers and it increases the zalimun into loss. So what happens is that the world is composed of those who believe and those who don't. And the Quran has come as mercy to the believers, but in a way, it is a curse to the unbelievers. Because it only increases them in things which are asara, which is sources of loss. So for Muslims, the Quran will increase you in Ahsan, and for non-Muslims, it will increase them in darkness. So in that sense, when you look at the Quran and the life of Prophet Sallallahu you find that Prophet Sallallahu is perhaps one of the greatest things that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala has created and sent to this world because he is sent as mercy to all of humanity. The Prophet Sallallahu is a mercy to believers as well as non-believers. The Prophet Sallallahu has been sent as mercy to humans and jinns and the environment and the planets and things and the creation that exists. Everything that exists to it, Rasulullah has been sent from God as mercy. Not even the Quran. The Quran is mercy for those who are believers. It is a guide to those who believe. For those who believe and trust in it, for them it is a guide. It is a warner to those who don't believe in it. It is a promise of punishment for those who don't believe in it. But Rasulullah has been sent as mercy to all of us, to all of humanity. And this is a very profound verse. The more you think about it, the more it unfolds. So what does it mean to be sent as mercy to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends the Rasulullah as mercy to humanity, he's fulfilling a promise that he made at the time which is before creation. According to a hadith of Qursi, before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the creation, he wrote a note to himself that may my mercy prevail over my wrath. And then he created the creation. But Allah constrained himself. He wanted his mercy to prevail over the wrath and the fulfillment of that promise is the entrance of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa in this world. That is the fulfillment of that promise. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has fulfilled his promise that his mercy will prevail over his wrath by sending his dearest prophet into this world. There are a lot of people who don't understand him. You, you probably will disagree with the next five minutes of my khutbah, but so be it. If I'm wrong, may Allah forgive me. If I'm right, may Allah reward us all. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, on the day of judgment, no intercession shall be available except the one for whom the most beneficial Allah has given permission and whose word is acceptable to him. Allah on the day of judgment, no one will be able to intercede on behalf of humanity except that person, that entity which has been given permission by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to intercede and whose word is acceptable to him. I know historically Muslims have abused this license and they have made lots of things wasila to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and there has been a backlash against it. But I doubt if there is any believer in this world who will question that this verse is about Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It can't be about anybody else. So not only has Rasulullah brought the message of Allah to us, which will reward us in this life and in the life in the hereafter, but he will also intercede on our behalf on the day of judgment. 
for those who are youngsters, perhaps if you think of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as a two-way portal between the two worlds, between the heavens and the earth. Allah communicates to us through his messenger Rasulullah, and we plead to him also through his messenger. This, this, this issue, a, a very famous Persian poet whose name was Sheikh Sadi, said something very simple and very beautiful. He said, Ba'das Khuda Buzur Tuhi Qissa Muqtasa. He said, After God, only you are great. This short story is very short. And I submit to you that there is no one greater than Allah. There is nothing greater than Allah. And there is nothing greater than Muhammad except Allah. There is nothing greater than Allah. And there is nothing greater than Muhammad except Allah. And that is something that we have to understand and inculcate in our life. These are the two things we have to grab. The light of Allah and the light of His Prophet. Without the light of Allah, we are not saved. And without the light of Muhammad, we can't grab the light of Allah. Because that mercy is our connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is that mercy by which Allah will forgive us. It is that mercy by which Allah will reward us. It is by that mercy that Allah has empowered us to become part of I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He gives us all this opportunity to understand the life of our dear Prophet sallallahu I also pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He empowers us to understand what is the status of the Prophet ﷺ in this cosmos? He's not an ordinary entity like anything else. He is the bridge between the two worlds. There are two worlds, that which is temporal and that which is eternal. The world that will finish. Kullu man alayha fam in Surah al Rahman, Allah said, everything that exists will perish in this world. And the only thing that will be left is the face of Allah, the, the world of eternity. And what is that bridge that connects the world of eternity and the world that will perish? It is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I have an announcement to make tomorrow, inshallah, at 4.30 to 8.30. Uh, we have a discussion and a lecture on the seerah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam at the Zakat Foundation. Uh, dinner will be served. It is free. You are all welcome. We also have a quiz on the life of the Prophet for adults as well as for youngsters. We had it last year and it came as a great surprise to all of us how little we know about the life of Prophet So if you are, you have children, if you have the time, please come there. Zakat Foundation at 4.30 to 8.30. We will talk about the seerah of Rasulullah May Allah give us all the tawfiq to understand him, inshallah.